everyone. This is Pradeep from Sydney, welcoming you all to episode 13 of GCC. And what is GCC? That is the mystery. This is 12 a.m., which is the midnight of Saturday and Sunday, the 16th and 17th of October. Yes, post the time change, uh, post start of summer time, the time difference between Sydney and India has increased by one hour. I am delighted to present once again some wonderful alumni. We present a perspective from 1976 to 2002. How many years is that? Let me see. 2000 minus 77 is equal to 23 plus 2 is equal to 25. 25 years span. I could have easily gone across to Anjali because she is the financial wizard. But jokes apart. So let's kick off and the gentleman that I am, I will start with the, you know, the lady or only one of the lady speakers today. And I'm delighted to welcome Anjali Obroy. And where is she? She's sitting somewhere in Spain. All I know about Spain is that uh, I read, I saw that movie, you know, I don't remember the name of the movie and they, they showed some Toma Tamo festival or something like that, you know. But apart from that, I know my daughter when she was in the UK, she used to travel a lot to Europe and uh, she found Spain a very lovely country. But we will ask Anjali as to how did she land up in Spain and what was her journey from Delhi to Spain. But more importantly, how long has she lived in India for that matter? So ladies and gentlemen, please give a big round of applause to Anjali. Anjali is 2002 IIT Delhi graduate. So, in the span that we are considering today, she is the youngest of the lot. Anjali, but I, I don't want to steal a thunder from her. So, let me go across to Anjali and ask her, Anjali, what have you been doing before you came to IIT Delhi? And what have you been doing after you left IIT Delhi? And how the hell did you land up in Spain? You know. So, over to you, Anjali. Thanks for, the, thanks for having me here and um, thank you for, for being up so late. Um, so um, it's nice to hear myself being called the youngest of a lot. I, I have a two and a four year old and I definitely feel some of the time. Um, so to your questions, I, so I grew up in Kuwait um, in the Gulf and uh, was... Angela, your voice is dropping in and out. Can you hear me well, better now? Yeah, this is better now. Yeah. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna stay closer. Um, so um, I grew up in Kuwait in the Gulf. Yeah, we missed what you said earlier. So if you can just repeat. Okay. Um, Thanks. So you I, are with the IT audience, so obviously you will get such kind of requests. So over to you. Back gonna, to you. <laughs> I'm gonna up the technology question here. Back. How's that? Is that better? Absolutely better. This is okay, called great. QD. These are my uh, my trucker headphones that I use for all my calls. So <laughs> uh, great, I'm glad that's working. Um, so to your question, I was um, I um, spent most of my childhood outside of India, um, except for a couple of years during the Gulf War when our family had to move to um, to India um, because Kuwait was under siege. And then once I finished high school, I um, joined IIT Delhi and uh, lived in Delhi for about five years. Uh, I was uh, I studied biochemical engineering biotechnology. So it was a dual degree program that had me there for five years. Um, and after IIT, um, I actually finished my last semester at IIT in uh, Switzerland. I went to the um, Ecole Pol Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne. I was at EPFL doing my master's, my thesis there. And when I finished, I Basically, I moved back to Delhi. I was there for a couple of years, um, joined business school, lived in a few countries for business school, finished in the US, um, started working in the US, lived back and forth across the US in a few countries. And then uh, about six years ago, made our first trip. We, uh, My husband and I came to the Canary Islands, where we are now, in Tenerife, for the first time and just completely fell in love with it. So we just kept coming back until they had no choice but to let us stay. So we're here. So 
what a journey but i want to pick up on that part of the journey when you were gallivanting across south america um that was when south you were america. back back <laughs> backpacking i was backpacking yes. so um i um i spent a few months actually half a year in south america backpacking and farming um across a few places so this was um after finishing at iit and moving to the us and finishing grad school there i worked at a consulting company for a number of years uh, you know and like like a lot of consulting roles particularly in the early years it was a, like a 27 role i was working 7 days a week 20 hours a day and finally i just about had enough um and i decided to take a break and rethink what i was going to be doing um and so that's when i left and started traveling and one of the sort of um um you know consistent interests in my life from probably the age of 2 until today has been chocolate uh and when i decided to leave and explore my next steps a little more i decided to go back to the that interest in um sort of back to the roots so to speak and so i uh moved there for a while to volunteer with farms and study the production and the history and essentially the economics of growing chocolate um and that was you know i spent a certain amount of time in ecuador i was in belize for a while i was in brazil for a while as well um kind of you know essentially farming where i could and learning where i could and volunteering where i could so um that that was that part so i want to pick up on the chocolate theme and i also want to pick up on your love for finance the first question is is it love for accounting or is it love for finance I think it's love for numbers. Oh, um, you are the numbers girl that means. Uh I like numbers, it makes sense. I have I have been known to say I'm I won't say that I'm proud of saying this but I do I have said it a lot. I sometimes wish people would function like Excel cells because you know exactly what to expect. Love you. Of them. Beautiful. Uh, so um it's definitely a love for numbers. So have you seen the Bollywood movie Shakuntala Devi? No, I actually haven't. I I, I'll I'll send you the details about that. That's about a very famous uh, mathematician, you know, who could actually just count very very large multiplication on the top of her hand. But more on that later on. So you clarified that you know it was a love for numbers and you love those Excel cells. What about the macros in Excel? Do you also love the macros? I do actually. I I like things that make life simpler. So <laughs> <laughs> okay so the other part of it you are also the sustainable girl so where did sustainability come about you know um my um i will say this i think i it, frankly it sounds it sounds a bit funny but it stems back to chocolate again so my entire life has essentially kind of focused around a love for this particular consumable if you want to call it that and if i could have studied it at iit i would have i couldn't um didn't have the option at the time so what i did end up doing was a master of thesis in food um science i focused on food science and tech during my masters uh, piece of being at iit and um and and going from there and one of the things that you know essentially from there i actually even briefly contemplated doing a phd in food science and kind of realized along the way that being in a lab was not where i wanted to be for the for the rest of my life um which is i think kudos to those people who do it um i knew that i wanted to come into food and approach it from a numbers perspective what really helped open up the the sort of the visuals for me on sustainability was essentially coming into um the farming side of things as i mentioned the more i worked on that side and the more i volunteered on that side and the more i saw how the entire production chain essentially moves from soil to plate um it it became really clear to me and you know it's a very clear thing to all of us these days it's become and it's become very mainstream these days and i'm really glad that it has but the fact is that if we do not focus on sustainably arriving at a solution of getting things from source to plate 
there soon will not be a source anymore. Um, and for me, the realization came from literally being on the farm and then also being on the other side of things as I was working to see the fact that, you know, having lived across different places in the US over time, because I've spent more of my adult life there, um, just realizing that regardless of how much got produced on the farming side, there were always food deserts that existed. And the amount of food spoilage that happened along the way in terms of just getting the access that people had, the distribution that, that they that was available to them, the quality of the nutrition that was available to them. And so for me, sustainability really kind of it came from a food angle and arose from there and very much became a part of everything that I do personally and uh, try to do professionally today. So what I'm loving is that when I talk about sustainability, how your face lights up, you know, and you get lost into the whole theme of it. But I'm also loving it that when I talk about Excel cells, man, what lovely expressions I see. But on a different front, what kind of a chocolate do you like? White, black, brown, which one do you like? I think white chocolate's just pretending to be chocolate, <laughs> to be honest. It's um, I, no, I, I definitely prefer the darker sort of stream of cacao. And, um, I think the true aspects of chocolate, how the beans are, are farmed, the soil that they come from, their, their roasting profile, all of that gets expressed much better in a darker chocolate. So tell me in your current role, you founded this company. So you are a combination of an entrepreneur as well as a CFO. You love being a CFO for multiple companies. So what is Bernoulli Finance with the company that you founded? What is it doing? Um, so we are a financial services firm. We work with small and medium sized businesses um, to help them with all aspects of financial management. Uh, we started out with just me. I say we today because, you know, it's actually been a, um, it's a mindset shift for me to think and remember that I have a team that beautifully supports what we do today. Um, and I started out about eight years ago um, with working with smaller firms because I was coming into this. I was moving out of a larger role at a company where I was working as a CFO. I started teaching alongside at a nonprofit. I was teaching small businesses, entrepreneurship, and really like business skills and finance and accounting skills. And I realized along the way that um, people come into their, into their businesses with, you know, with passion, with learning, with identifying market fit and market gaps. And often they fail along the way because of an because of not having set a solid finance and operational foundation. And so Bernoulli Finance tries to do just that. We work with these entrepreneurs who've either, you know, are at a pre-revenue or a concept stage looking to develop their plan, but more likely have, are well underway, are completely running in a thousand different directions because that's what entrepreneurs do and don't have the time to focus on setting their finance foundations right. Um, and we help them build and maintain those. So do you just help them, in a sense, coach them, or do you also help in arranging finance and a typical kind of a startup incubation, acceleration, do you also do that kind of activities? So I sometimes call our work um, as being financial therapists and psychologists. Wow. Because uh, oftentimes when we work with entrepreneurs, there's a sense that the numbers are important, but not really an articulation of the problem as such. And so when we work with them, a lot of it is listening to what's hurting. You know, I'm making money, but I just don't see the cash in the bank. I'm always busy, but I don't know, you know, where this is going to take me eventually. Is it the right time for me to hire somebody? Should I be bringing on financing right now? Is it okay for me to give away 30% of my company for this raise? <laughs> of money that I desperately need to keep the lights on tomorrow. And so we help them with figuring out and answering all of those questions. Uh, we are not just coaches. We definitely, coaching is a big part of what we do, but we essentially come in to implement their financial systems. Do we have a team of operations folks who do their day-to-day -day accounting and setup and so on, because, you know, one of the things we realized very 
early on is garbage in is garbage out. So if you don't have the right numbers, you won't have the right reports. And if you don't have the right reports, you can't use them to make the right decisions. And so we basically help them with all aspects of getting their numbers in, having their system set up to spit out the right results or trustable results really at the right time, and then use those to help them make decisions going forward. And we also help them when they get to a point of figuring out if they need to raise financing, does, you know, one of the big questions is always, do you actually need to bring on money? Can you do this another way? Is there a better way to do this? And so we work with them to figure that out and then move on from there. So Anjali, do your eyes light up when you see hard cash, aka dollars or spreadsheet sales? You know? um, I'm going to say spreadsheet sales. Oh, you, you can give the dollars to me then. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now your husband is also in the same business as you. That's so, right. We so run it, it together. So is it uh, Excel spreadsheets even at the dinner table? You know, we, we've we worked very hard to put boundaries around where the work discussions stop and the personal discussions begin. But we've been working together on and off for years. And also before he joined the company full time, joined me in running it full time, we worked for years in advising each other and strategizing with each other in our businesses. So we've managed to create, I would say, fluid boundaries around where the work stops and where, you know, personal begins. Um, and as I mentioned, now, now that we have two little ones, they make it very clear where the work stops. So, so that tell helps. me, how much is two plus two? Depends on the day. <laughs> <laughs> So I do want to mention that I met Anjali through Anshil. So it has been absolutely fabulous to talk to you. Uh, I have lots more to talk to you, uh, but and I will be picking up the threads once again. Uh, after this call, I'll have another call with you to get you more involved in GCC. Because at the end of the day, it's all about building a global platform, you know, where different alumni can connect with each other on a value proposition basis. Now. What do you remember of IIT Delhi when you left and what do you think is happening to IIT Delhi now? Not that even I could tell you uh, <laughs> that, 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 that about, but what do you think? Have you been connected at all with IIT Delhi since you left IIT Delhi? I've been um, very connected with my particular year of the female batchmates. We have, uh, it's actually been really great because in the last few years, somebody took the initiative to create a WhatsApp group and we all stayed in touch and we keep each other posted. I actually met one of uh, my classmates, a friend after 20 years, uh, just last week. Um, so that was incredible. Um, and so I have stayed in touch with them. I, I am more, you know, I am in touch with, I would say sort of um, a scattered group of people across years more and those outside of this particular group and those are usually more driven by professional interests and the occasional friendship but i have to say outside before connecting with gcc and seeing you create this for the um it, it the alum network has not felt very accessible and so i must thank you for for doing this because it's starting to feel more accessible uh in terms of you know just connecting with people now that is so sweet of you. What value proposition would you want or something which will attract you to be continuously more engaged with GCC or IIT Delhi Alumni Association? Um, I am going to echo, I think, a few things that other uh, folks have said. Um, you know, for instance, the GCC, uh, the call that you had with the Kailash group the other day, I do agree um, with a lot of the ideas mentioned there. For me, mentoring at a 360 degree level like essentially just you know up and down and sometimes it's it's not about which year you graduated or how old someone is but it's about what milestones or what experiences they've had in your career that might be relevant to yours i think that is really valuable um i love the idea of special interest groups as well because clearly that spans across it's, it doesn't matter which batch you graduated in it matters you know that you have an interest that pushes you all together Thank you so much. And for your information, you know, all the other four girls that we had in Kailash remembered you so much and it would have been fun to have you along with them. But, you know, your travels are so hectic. 
Hmm. You are always and I always worry that are you also carrying your kids along with you as well as your husband along with you when you travel. But jokes apart, absolutely wonderful to have you. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a big round of applause to Anjali. Thank you, Anjali, really. I've had a follow-up call with all the four girls over there. And likewise, I will be having a follow-up call and look forward to, you know, continuing this discussion. I look okay. forward to it. Fabulous. And now we move across from 2002 to where should we go? Which year should we go? Okay, let's go to 1976. So that let's see when possibly Anjali was just being born or not even born when this guy finished <laughs> IIT Delhi, you know. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a big round of applause to Sanjay Seth. 1976 BTEC IIT Delhi. Aravli. Then went on to Aravli, of course. Thank you so much, Narendra. And then went on to do I am Ahmedabad. And then after that, let Sanjay tell us. Sanjay, are you there? Yes, very, very much here. Man. And thank you. Happy to be here. Man. I'm just trying to remember the Sanjay that I used to know in Aravli <laughs> 42 years back. Actually, your face is still very much the same. Apart from that, looks like, you know, although I can't see your body, but looks like you, you know, put on a little bit, little bit of weight, but so have I. So, Sanjay, absolutely lovely to meet you. Yeah. Tell me, tell me, you know, what happened? What did you, after IMA, what did you do? <clears throat> Thank you, Pradeep. And first of all, I'd like to tell everybody that it ah. is only Pradeep Khanna with all the energy and this masterly networking he gets everybody involved and in last few years that we reconnected uh, he is really uh, you know brought this concept of global networking in my mind at least so thanks pradeep uh, i'm happy to be here yeah after i am i worked for a couple of years <clears throat> you know uh, in the corporate sector and then my desire to become an entrepreneur you know took over i jumped into business i was in ahmedabad and, you know, I had given up my chemical engineering a while back when I joined my MBA. And uh, in business also, we I went into electronics. So I was in uh, business for 16 years. And that was, you know, all those period of 91 when we had this foreign exchange crisis and all sorts of things. But anyways, after 16 years, I was... Uh, my business shut down and I was bankrupt. So I went back. Luckily, I had those two degrees, you know, IIT and uh, IIM. And that helped me back into a job uh, because children's fees had to be paid. The rent had to be taken care of. And I joined Tata's and I was with Tata's for 10 years, <clears throat> including us, you know, last few with TCS. So I left uh, TCS and joined SAP. So that's the corporate uh, sector, Pradeep. Uh, around uh, 2008, 2009, I was getting really fed up of the corporate life. And uh, not, you know, it was because uh, one quarter would finish and then the next quarter would start. And, you know, there were always target, new targets would start. And I found that all I was doing was working for money. It was not satisfying at all. Narendra, can you mute yourself, please? No, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yes, back to you, Sanjay. Yeah. So <clears throat> I decided that I needed to find something more meaningful in my life. Uh, and I started looking to do, uh, you know, look for a non-profit <clears throat> social sector work. I really didn't know what exactly I was going to do, but I jumped out of the job and started putting some, you know, trying to put an NGO together on uh, education. So I wandered around for a couple of years before I finally got a job with Bloomberg, uh, one of the Bloomberg <coughs> uh, companies or partners in tobacco control. Uh, this was campaign for tobacco free kids and they were working on tobacco control. So since then, I've been working in the social sector, Pradeep. So that's, you see, this is a remarkable journey. 
you are in the corporate, you are an entrepreneur, and you are then trying to discover who you, who you really are, and then you are in the social sector. So tell me, in the social sector, what are you doing exactly? Yeah. So Pradeep, <clears throat> we are, uh, I started working with Bloomberg and I worked with them for five years. Uh, but sometime around 2011, we also we started our own nonprofit called Samband Health Foundation, uh, which was which is working in mental health, mental illness. So we work with uh, severe uh, mentally ill people, schizophrenia, bipolar, deep depression, and we've set up. Uh, there's a center in Gurgaon. That's where we live. Uh, but I don't work in mental illness. Uh, my wife does because my wife and I were both caregivers and that's how we ventured into, uh, you know, mental illness. Uh, but my wife and a classmate from IIM, uh, who, was, who was a big hotshot in advertising world, uh, the two of them are looking after the mental uh, health uh, part. And after five years of working with Bloomberg, I and a whole lot of us, we shifted our, you know, our tobacco control work also into Sambandh. So right now, Sambandh does two things. One is mental health and the other is tobacco control. I work full time in the tobacco control. I happen to be the managing trustee also, uh, but I have very little day to day work in the mental health side. <clears throat> so who's the managing trustee at home? Uh, <laughs> uh, you are recording this, right? So I have to be very <laughs> diplomatic about it. Uh, well, the, the managing trustee is, is, is my wife uh, very much at home. Love it. What I would have loved to do is to have you and Chitranjan Dhar on the same platform on the same day. Chitranjan refuses to have uh, lunch with me because he says he'll lose his job if he, uh, you know, uh, if, if he's seen having lunch with me. I actually asked him, I said, next time you're here, Chitranjan, by the way, for the rest of the people on this, uh, in this call, uh, he works in ITC, which is our chain, uh, you know, chief uh, uh, rival. Of, I mean, that's our target. That's our enemy number one, uh, ITC. And he is a vice president there. He's a good personal friend he was with i am also with me and uh, a good friend with pradeep also that is absolutely right uh, i mean chitranjan is a very dear friend of mine as well as with sanjay but you know the irony of it was just stuck me just now when i was kind of listening to sanjay say just now when he talked about you know tobacco and, uh, and you know to be honest with you do you know sanjay that i used to smoke about 30 cigarettes a day um, before i migrated to australia and that is, I gave it up 31 years back, not that I had great, uh, you know, visions of, you know, that I really want to give it up, but my thoughts were that I'm migrating to a new country and a new, I used to get very uh, throat upsets every second month. And will I be able to afford to go to a doctor and all that kind of a thing? And I gave it up. But when I look at the graphic ads on TV, I said, man, I can't imagine that I was smoking for so long. You know, it, it, it's, it's uh, shocking. Shocking, but that's that's what it is. So Sanjay, you used to be a very active in RCA. You used to be, you know, in debating. You used to be in dramatics and whole lot of stuff. Any of that still? That raging fire is still there? No, unfortunately, <laughs> most of that has gone out, and just uh, staying fit is, uh, you know, right now, uh, you know, a, a priority. But uh, it's become like an essential priority, right? So. So tell me, uh, what were you doing in Goa when I spoke to you just a couple of days back? Oh, Goa was a personal visit, uh, Pradeep. But, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, Goa has been a very uh, good uh, success story for tobacco control. And if you allow me, I'd like to just share our experiences of what we have done in the social sector. Absolutely. <clears throat> So, you know, I, I started with tobacco control about in 2010. And one of the, uh, at, at that time, we used to find that, uh, you know, none of the ministers, none of the bureaucrats would actually listen to us. Uh, you, you, when you sought a meeting, you know, you were lucky if you got a meeting after three weeks and that also with somebody very junior in the ministry. 
and we, I, I looked around and I found that that was happening to almost. Your voice has dropped. Yeah, sorry. I think I muted myself. A mistake. Yeah. So <clears throat> uh, we were looking about, you know, for a way to get ourselves heard. None of the policy makers were really paying attention to us. Uh, when we started finding, we, we, we you know, chanced upon this, uh, you know, cancer patients, you know, victims of tobacco. And we said, okay, let's, if they're not listening to us, let's put the victims of tobacco uh, in front of the policymakers. So we said, okay, look, you guys don't listen to us, but listen to the stories of what tobacco does to people who use it. And that somehow worked. It started with <clears throat> Shushma Swaraj. Uh, she was really impressed. We took five cancer patients to her house and she said, okay, you bring the cancer patients, you bring these, you know, uh, victims and I'll bring the MPs. And we organized a program in Delhi in which she brought, you know, 45 members of parliament. She was wow. the leader of the opposition at that time. And I was, we were really impressed. And of course, we got a huge amount of media coverage. And then we realized that, you know, this is a good way to go around, you know, convincing policymakers about, you know, why they needed to look at tobacco control seriously. And some of the stories, you know, which we came across were really heart-rending. Till then, for me, this had been more like a job than a passion. Because like Pradeep, I used to also smoke 30 cigarettes a day, you know, for 25 years. And I gave it up because I had a heart attack. Uh, so, so, you know, some of the stories are really, uh, you know, uh, there, there is, for instance, uh, this, you know, young couple came to this hospital in Assam, and this is quite recently, two, three years back, uh, below poverty line couple, the man had cancer. And uh, the doctors, it was a free hospital, they said, we'll treat you free, but there's this little test you have to run, uh, which cost, you know, 5,000 rupees, and this you have to pay for. And they said, we don't have 5,000 rupees. So this was going back and forth a bit. And then the woman they said, okay, okay, I'm coming back. Uh, she came back next day with 5,000 rupees. So the doctor, who's a friend of mine, the director of the institute there, asked her, where did you get this money from? So she had gone and sold her seven-year-old child oh to, the, to the uh, sahukar over there. And that boy was, you know, ringing up. Her mother, you know, look, babe, he's making me do work to fetch water and this, please come and collect me. So these doctors were shocked, you know. So they said they put 5,000 rupees together and said, you look, go and get your son back. And she's burst and she started crying. She says, you know, I made my deal. I can't go back. So finally, the one of the doctors went and got the child back. But these are the kind of stories, you know, there were hundreds of them. Shocking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we started bringing this and we formed this thing called the Voice of Tobacco Victims. And we now have more than 400 uh, very senior doctors, mostly oncologists from 25 states who volunteer their time with us. And this has helped us to bring around a lot of policy changes. We got Gutka banned in India. We got taxes increased 40 times. Uh, we got, uh, you know, uh, the pictorial warning in australia you have plain mm. pack you know plain mm. packaging okay which we've got india became uh, you know got 85 percent of the tobacco products are now have a pictorial warning on it right so that uh, was uh, we did a lot of advocacy for that uh, and then we, we we realized that you know all these policy changes we got other laws changed but these are all pieces of paper and they don't really have an impact unless you can implement them, unless you uh, make these policies you know, on the ground and that's not been happening in India. In fact, now, you know, after 10 years of working in, in, in this area, I can tell you that you know, policy change is relatively easier to bring about. India has very good policies, good laws, but implementation is where the challenge is, especially in public health. So we started, we've been working for the last seven, eight years on implementation of policy. And one of the key programs we've picked up is tobacco-free educational institutions. 
You see, the big conundrum in tobacco control is that most people, Pradeep, like you, me, like um, maybe the other smokers here, we all started when before we were 19. And, uh, you know, once you get addicted, there are very few people who can give it up. Actually, the quit rate in India is less than 4%. 4%. So you can keep chasing people all their lives. You know, please give up, please give up. And it doesn't work because people give up and then restart. Uh, I used, I gave up so many times. But the best strategy, therefore, is you stop them from starting. So we have this program which Ministry of Health has made which is to do a certain number of activities in every school in the country, uh, you know, and uh, so that that those activities together protect children from the influence of tobacco, or at least try to. Uh, and this research has shown that these things work. But again, the big challenge has been to roll it out. So last, especially now that the pandemic came around, we earlier used to go to, you know, schools, uh, we used to organize, you know, meetings where teachers would come and we'd, you know, educate them on what they have to do. So all that got wiped out because of the pandemic. But last 16 months, I'm very happy to tell you that we went into, a, you know, a digital methodology. We made an app and we started teaching using webinars. And we've, in the last 16, 18, 17 months now, we've managed to add 1.8 lakh, 180,000 schools, you know, onto our platform. Uh, which covers about uh, you know seven lakh seven hundred and seventy thousand teachers and about uh, sixteen million children. That's the coverage so far. So that program is now rolling out quite well, and this is all being done with our, my team sitting at home. So it, it's it's working out pretty well. This is fabulous. Uh, you see, this is where you know I want to recap. When I started GCC, when I started talking about value proposition, the challenge was that we've got alumni from 1966 to 2020. Whereas the alumni of 1966 or for that matter in 70s or for that matter in you know early 80s are focused on give back, they want to give to social causes, they want to contribute towards nation building, they want to give to IIT and that kind of stuff. Whereas you've got a from 2020 who wants to look at how to scale up his startup and how to progress further in his job. So this, there is a very strong element or there is a strong segment within the alumni who is looking to give back. And I think this is one of the prime cases, you know, where we should get you more involved into GCC because I know that some, some of our colleagues from 1967 batch recently gave $25,000 to IIT Delhi because they wanted to promote arts as a part of education of an engineer. So there is a whole lot of stuff that is happening and I'm really delighted to see the work that you are doing Sanjay. And last question, and actually two questions. What was the TEDx that you were talking about? What was the theme of the TEDx? Yeah, so Pradeep, uh, I basically shared the experience of uh, trying to get public uh, policies, uh, you know, to work and how we use this voice of tobacco victims uh, campaign uh, to bring about change in the mindset of policymakers. You know. So that was the talk, the TEDx talk about. So the last question is that what value proposition would attract you to GCC and to IIT Delhi Alumni Association? <clears throat> yeah. So, Pradeep, what is amazing is that, you know, uh, so many, I mean, in, in, in your shows itself, I'm seeing that so many people from IIT have moved into, uh, you know, so many other areas from diplomats to, you know, uh, finance companies in Spain to you know, all kinds of different professions. And what I found, you know, in the social sector, one thing, you know, which has helped, I mean, I really found was that a lot of the experience I got over the years as an entrepreneur and the corporate sector, a lot of it came together to find solutions which are working. So I really think that the, the cross fertilization of ideas and, and this huge and this networking platform which you're creating uh, can really bring a lot of value to, you know, to different people like myself, you know.
you know, I mean, if you ask me to define what exactly will I get, I don't know. But you know, things have a funny way of you know turning up. You know, suddenly somebody will call me up after this thing to your show and say, "Hey, I want, I have some technology, and you might want to, you know, try and use this in your area." You know, and it works. It has happened. So I, I really think that's a huge uh, value addition which we could we could get. Absolutely fabulous to have you, Sanjay, and absolutely fabulous to reconnect back after so many years. I know we met about five, six years, and that's also I want to share with uh, the group is that I met Sanjay after you know what thirty, forty years or something like that, and we caught up for a nice cup of tea, and we got talking, and then I found out he's a son at a startup which was doing what? Uh, it was making Indian burgers. I, I think it was called Maharaja King or something like that. What was no, that no. thing? Huh? Burger Singh. Burger Singh. Singh. Yes. And what a fabulous concept. But that's what it is. When you reconnect, you find such wonderful stories about each other and you rediscover each other. So, ladies and gentlemen, please give a big round of applause to Sanjay. And I will be. I have already shared the YouTube in my last email, but I will be sharing the YouTube once again. And I love the work that you are doing, Sanjay. All the very best to you, and I will be in touch with you to get you more involved into GCC. Take Thank care. You. And Thank you. Thank you, Pradeep. Thank you, everybody. From seventy-six, it is just convenient for me to go to seventy-seven. So, whom else should I go to but Narendra the Dalmia? And folks. I was pleasantly surprised when I actually I didn't even I had not not even spoken maybe spoken once in forty two years over a phone call to Narendra, but I was pleasantly surprised when I saw his face, you know, beaming out of a magazine cover. And I said, "Well, this guy looks like somebody I know." So, folks, please give a big round of welcome to Narendra Dalmia, and let me tell you. He, although he studied in IIT Delhi, he is very much a Sindhi at heart. And why do I say that? Because he's kept on doing one business as the other, and so on and so forth. But let's not take the fire from yeah, Narendra. Narendra, over to you. Thank you, Pradeep. First of all, Can I don't I see. I don't see the hands giving a big round of applause. Folks, go for it. So, yes, Narendra, tell us what were you doing at IIT Delhi, and what what subject were you doing at IIT Delhi? I was in chemical engineering as uh, an undergrad for the New Delhi Hospital, uh, hospital. And uh, after IIT, I did not pursue further studies. I did not go to the US high school, and that probably is a mistake that I made at that time. Would you like to maybe bit move a bit closer to the computer screen so that maybe the sound can get better? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear. Is it better now? Yes, it is better. Okay. So, uh, I am uh, just a small person. I am a Marwari, not a Sindhi. Oh. So to my so, mind, all these people who make money come under the same category. You know, whether you call them Marwari or Sindhi. So, but jokes apart. Hmm. Post IIT, I had joined a, a job in a company called Pesticides and Brewers Limited in Bombay, where I was an executive engineer looking after the maintenance of the plant. And I worked there for three years. It was a great experience. It was a very crisis managed company with poor cash. Systems and then too many uh, uh, technical problems in managing the plant with very high toxic uh, chemicals like benzene hexafluoride and benzene and all. So that gave me a very good, rich experience of fighting fires in all the shop floor. Post that, as I there was a family pressure to get into business, and uh, as a young by 26 age, I started a uh, factory at Bati near Bombay, manufacturing basic drugs. So I started manufacturing Thunderdor, which was an anti-QB drug, small plant, 
and uh, then we added erythromycin, antistim, and oxystim, and there is other products. But from there, I moved on to, uh, of course, there were some reasons for that business, which did not continue for beyond five or six years. And then textile had been my family business, my dad's time. So I joined textiles, we took a plant in 1986 for a textile yarn. Uh, one of the friends that I can see, Vijay Ayo, I think it's Sambo. He sold me the first machine, I think Vijay is there. He sold me the first machine, uh, he was with the machine manufacturing company. And uh, post that, I did in textile. In between in 96, uh, I was fascinated by the new technology called IT, software business. I didn't know much, it was not my subject. But I had a passion to do something about it. So I found two young technical guys in Bangalore who were running a small business, but they had they were great technical persons. I took them on board as a working partner, funded the project, and we floated a company called Metcraft in Bangalore in 1996. That was the time when most of the big companies were focusing on YTK. And we got into multimedia creation as well as ERP. That was a very early time. We worked hard in the Indian market, but we did not get much success. So we moved to US and there we started getting good business. Within four years, Netcraft was a reasonably sized good company with almost like 320 engineers. And in 2001, uh, I realized that it's very difficult for me to handle the cash flows, the demand for the money, which I didn't have. So I sold this company to a fund, British fund, just before 9911. And I moved out, moved out of there. <laughs> Again, uh, I was looking for another good opportunity and then I got 2007 when I, in textile, I have been for so many years, but mostly it was a conventional polyester yarn business, which was not very fascinating to me. And I got attention of technical textiles being talked about in India. And I used to study the international news. And we realized that technical textile is something like almost half of Textile business in the world, in the developed countries, while in India, it was a very nascent scale. So I started quoting, uh, writing mails to some of the companies in the US who were uh, making technical textiles and got connected with some companies in the US for strata systems. And we hit upon, we quoted a company in India as a joint venture. They were mainly into the geo. Geosynthetics business, geotextiles. Geotextiles are basically technical textiles, and application is all in the civil engineering. Whether it is for the soil reinforcement, or whether for load support, or erosion control, there are many applications. So, with the help of US partners, I learned the technology and uh, it took us two years with zero business to understand that technology and to promote that in Indian infrastructure sector. But it was too early for that sector at that time. And most of the civil contractors whom I would approach, they said, we don't know what extent can do in a civil construction. I mean, we are used to steel, cement, and all those. We, we don't believe in textiles. So, and the solution that I was trying to pitch for was making the ramps for the flyovers. See, flyover is got two components. One is the central uh, concrete portion, and then we make the two arms, which are called ramps, which are soil filled, and the walls, the edges are straight, it cannot stand on its own. So it has to be reinforced using geo which are the 
polyester yarn based textile that we started manufacturing in india and uh, so most of the contractors said this looks good and the price was very good we were almost cutting down half the cost as against the conventional technology so people were tempted and this is guys we don't understand and we can't take a risk so if i were to ask you narendra you are making waves in infrastructure at the moment but when i look at the journey you started off with pharmaceutical manufacturing then you went into textiles then you went into it then in a way you applied textiles to infrastructure so what was this was this the marwari blood or was this the iit delhi education after the first venture of uh pharmaceutical there i could apply my engineering knowledge after that i became more of a an entrepreneur than a uh, than a technician of course technology learning you always come to it but then it was always a new learning for me and i could never be a champion for that particular subject so i would take so i mean you uh, find people who knew the subject better and uh, we want to take the health to the company so the it company that you sold off to a uk group did you sell it before the tech crash in 2001 or after the tech crash yeah. uh, maybe just about 3 4 months before the crash so you got a lot of dollars or pounds for that matter yeah, dollars i mean the uh, the british fund anyway to to somebody from a marwari family and you know with so much of uh, so uh, jokes apart um, how did you kind of think up of you know leveraging textile technology into infrastructures i mean first of all when you look at different you know, businesses that you've been you never even thought about that there are different kind of industries altogether did that not bother you guys are dust because it requires lots and lots of hard work it's very easy and believe me to start a company from scratch is never easy with the early formative years are extremely extremely challenging where we risk the money that we are putting into the business where we ourselves are learning from the industry from the professionals that we hire we have to apply our business uh plan for growth because sustainability is very important and today growth is the sustainability so it's never been easy but it always excited me to do something to do. that was the passion i always had you see the thing why i'm asking this question is because i recall the discussion that we had with suman sena in the last session and there again you know you saw that one end he was dealing in corporate finance and then suddenly here is this into infrastructure where it is you know land acquisition in some rural areas and very very interesting uh, perspectives so likewise here also i find that one end is you know it outsourcing that what you were doing earlier and then again you head into a different area and we are talking about the time when the startup ecosystem was not at all as well developed as, as it is now so Uh, when you kind of go out to new areas how do you kind of learn that industry is it by networking or do you kind of reap out to your classmates or how do you kind of go about it so we have to take professionals in the group we have to either to a state board some kind of state equity or maybe a joint venture partnership so you cannot risk a business Uh, and there's something you have an anchor person who is an expert in the technology but that also you see because end of the day in order to find good professionals also you got to have uh, understanding of the business you know otherwise it's like a lala company you know kind of something going on and you know you got something going on um but, but this is a fabulous journey so now in in the current uh, scheme where you are are there thoughts now to go into yet another new industry <laughs> now i'm thinking of it i have to for you this is my last venture it's not even thin but i may be in four years then i retire when i'm 70 maybe i follow the path of sanjay uh in the some social work i'm very highly impressed by what you mentioned this is something which excites me again so maybe that kind of a venture will be my new venture 
Fabulous. You see, my mantra is that you see, all of us are going to be living longer. We will not only be continuously learning, but we will continue to work for a number of reasons. We can't be 24 by 7 connected one day and the other say we can be play golf for three months, you know. Number two is that yes, we will keep working till the time we drop dead, but it will be at our own convenience whether it is two hours a week or whether it is seven days a week. And also it will be something which is what we are passionate about. You know. So I can tell you very clearly that I do not see you retiring, retiring at 70. Well, you've gone through you're looking at your lifespan and easily tells me the same story. Yes, the direction is going to be changing. And I love, yes, you know, we are in that mode when you want to do give back. But at the same time, there are people who are younger alumni who want to grow. So such is that what is the value proposition that you would see from GCC? GCC, uh, as I said, uh, this particular business is very different and uh, I do not know whether I find to share with people who would take interest for instance in any business and maybe we can discuss. Uh, since uh, geosynthetics are like a new material for civil construction and may not be in India, it's an it's a early stage, but in other countries it is sold even at a home. So that kind of a uh, uh, Evolution that we have to bring in India. We can save natural resources, we can save the carbon footprints, and that's what excites me. From GCC, another thing we can do is connect with more people like Sanjay, where we can put some CSR funds or where we can put some kind of a, uh, uh, and start maybe uh, a bit early when I retire, before I retire, and build a network. Uh, so that once I retire, I can get involved into this, this kind of thing. Absolutely love it. Please give a big round of applause to Narendra. And I will connect the pipe between Narendra and Sanjay. Take care and fabulous to have you. And now let's move across to 1984. To a lovely guy who's sitting in Hong Kong who was introduced to me by Nawal Jaggi. He is Nawal Jaggi's friend. Please give a big round of applause to Shankar. 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 Are you still lost in whining and dining clients? No, 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 we don't. I basically invest money. Uh, so what... Uh... I have done for most of my professional life so uh, first of all, before, since 1993. Before you, before you, you know, justify that you don't always wine and dine, let me ask you that post IIT Delhi in 1984, you went to XLRI. Now, a lot of people go to XLRI and end up into, you know, HR or related professions. How did you happen to go into... No, XLRI had two streams. Uh, uh, you know, it had business management and uh, the personal management and IR. Uh, I was in the business management stream. Uh, it's interesting you ask because our batch was small. We had about 50 people, of whom I think 36 have become CEOs of uh, various businesses. So I though it was a small board, uh, it has done well. So briefly, in terms of my journey after IIT, I, uh, you know, I studied civil engineering, and uh, I think I was the only guy from my batch who took up a side job. Uh, I joined a firm called Pahadpur Cooling Towers. Um, so those days, it typically took about 10, 15 years before you became in charge of a large site. Uh, I became in three months, and I, of course, was convinced uh, it was because of my genius. But uh, the reason, actually, I got the job was uh, it was a law and order problem place, and no one in the firm wanted to go there. So I, I had not yet turned 22, and uh, I was uh, running this uh, site with about three, three and a half thousand people. Um, I used to have these country made pistols kept on my head to extort money and for various things. Uh, I've seen people get killed, etc. So I did that for about a year and a half, and then I thought there are better ways of making a living. I had got interested in. Uh, investing money at that stage. Um, I took up a job which covered northeastern India and eastern India. 
so I used to manage sites as well as uh, market uh, two things, uh, give her all pre-stressing systems uh, for bridges, nuclear reactors, et cetera, and uh, something known as splicing systems, you know, so we worked uh, in these uh, underwater tunnels, uh, you know, et cetera, where you couldn't weld. So after that, I went to business school and joined Citibank as a trader. Uh, and those days uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, if you joined Citibank, the way you made your careers, you did a couple of years in India and then tried to find a job in London or New York or Singapore or Tokyo, or whatever it is. So I got a job offer to go to Taipei as country risk manager. So at that stage, one of the billionaire clients of the bank with whom I was friendly uh, told me why I wanted to go to Taipei, why didn't we buy companies? So I had not yet turned 30, I became the CEO of something called Hathway Investments. And the first deal that came our way was a company called Johnson Tiles. It was India's largest ceramic tile company. Uh, mind you, I had not done the gig as an analyst, associate, et cetera. So I, had, uh, I was probably more Forrest Gump at that stage than private equity, though I was the CEO of that business. And uh, so I studied the balance sheet, um, and I called this billionaire guy up, and I, he asked me, Kaisa hai, achha hai, and we bought the company. And I didn't even know you had to do a due diligence, so they asked me, when will you pay for it? So I told them I'll pay it for it in two, three days. I paid for it in two days, and we got a controlling interest of the company. Now, we thought there was management. There wasn't management, so I actually ran it as CEO for a year, uh, though I had zero background in ceramic tiles. Uh, but eventually, the deal worked out very well. We bought the company for about 36 crores then. Uh, we made about six, 700 crores, you know, developing the land in which the first factory built in 1958 uh, in Thane was. We shifted the factory uh, to Penn, uh, to a place called Penn, which is on the Bombay Goa Road, about two hours out from there. And uh, today, of course, Johnson Tiles has uh, sales of about two and a half thousand crores, so it's become a big business. So similarly, we got control of a company called Exide, which is India's largest battery maker. And we literally made a battery which you could buy for something as low as $3, uh, dollars, which went into motorcycles. Or you could buy a $30 million submarine, most people, uh, uh, a battery that went into submarines, you know, uh, you know those large batteries which went into uh, uh, all the submarines of the Indian Navy. Uh, so that's become a multi-billion dollar business. Uh, then I was involved in various companies, Prism Cement. Uh, we had partnerships with Franklin Templeton in asset management, with O'Broys in hotels. So that was um, a pretty interesting stint. And the last company I really ran as CEO was a company called Pushpa Polymers, uh, where we had to house the MD in a board meeting. So I had to take it over, uh, you know, for a couple of months. It was a bit unfortunate because I had got um, a scholarship called the Chevening Scholarship to go to the London School of Economics for some time. So I was not able to go for that because I had to be MD of this. So we sold this uh, business to BASF. And then I had my first stint in Hong Kong where I did private equity for uh, Deutsche Bank. Then I came back and I was with the Carlyle Group first as the head of their business in India for the mid market. And then I became co-head of Asia for Carlyle. And uh, so I've done a lot of businesses uh, uh, you know, two, uh, the two largest independent engineering design companies out of India, uh, I've served on the board of them. Uh, one is called Scient, it used to be called Infotech before, and another is called Quest. Uh, both these companies have about, uh, today, about 14,000, 15,000 engineers worldwide, a uh, majority of whom are in India, about seven, 8,000 of them would be in India. And they design everything from aircraft engines to Caterpillar. Uh, yeah, start karna hai, okay. hai kuch. Vijay, uh, please be on mute. You know, so, uh, so multiple uh, uh, design things uh, we do. And then I left Carlisle, uh, uh, you know, about two and a half years back and founded uh, the Sanaka Group. We are again a mid-market uh, fund that invests uh, uh, in uh, various companies. We typically look for linkages uh, to India. So... Uh, we have combined four U.S. companies with an Indian company. That's a deal I did with Carlyle. Uh, we bought a controlling interest in a distribution management software company and combined it with a, a data analytics company that does artificial intelligence. Uh, we've invested in uh, this engineering design company I, I told you about. Uh, so we basically look for businesses uh, that grow. 
So my general approach to investing is, uh, you know, companies are like human beings in many ways. So if you're writing the GMAT exam, you keep getting 500, you're not going to get 800. So in real life, toads rarely become princesses. So I look for businesses that are profitable, growing, you know, 20, 25, 30%. Uh, try not to buy an egg for the price of a chicken. Don't overpay for the asset. Then your IRR pretty much mirrors uh, the kind of growth uh, that uh, you've achieved. Uh, of course, the challenge of doing business in India is, uh, of course, that um, uh, you know uh, the integrity of the people you back is very important because uh, you cannot wake up a guy who pretends to sleep. So it really becomes a challenge if uh, you partner, especially in minority situation, uh, with people um, uh, you know who uh, you know are not honest. And by integrity, it's encompassing. It's people who comply with laws, who adhere to pollution norms, who treat their workers fairly. Because eventually, you can't build a world-class business by indulging in short-term gratification and cutting corners. So, and I, I think that part of it is important. The other thing our batch has done, which uh, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of, uh, one of the things I think in a society like India where there is huge wealth disparity is, um, uh, you know, we got to ensure uh, equality of opportunity because uh, eventually, you know, you can't guarantee outcomes, you know, because eventually if you see, uh, uh, you know, it is uh, free markets that is uh, taken uh, millions of people out of poverty. And free markets are a way of rewarding human resourcefulness, uh, enterprise, etc. Uh, and free markets tend to have winners and losers. So it becomes important that people who are successful find a way to make sure opportunity is given. So our batch uh, gives out scholarships. Uh, we've uh, selected, uh, I think, about 40 kids. Uh, from year one to year four to give them scholarships, uh, you know, for fees, et cetera. Um, I was uh, seeing uh, on one of the TV programs uh, a lady who's a forest service officer saying uh, that in really some of these poor rural communities uh, where people are from disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, scheduled car, scheduled tribes, et cetera, you find extraordinarily bright children uh, who just don't have money to buy books, uh, uh, you know, uh, who don't have... Um, uh, the kind of resources which if they had, uh, they could uh, uh, hope to have a uh, reasonably successful life. So I think, uh, you know, I that's think a, it's kind of incumbent. That's a fabulous, fabulous story, uh, uh, Shankar. Yeah, I mean, really, yeah, no. yeah. Right. yeah, so it becomes incumbent for, you know, people from IIT batches, etc., uh, to contribute towards society because eventually if you do not uh, give people opportunity, uh, then, you know, I think society loses a lot and people will start questioning the fairness of the system. Uh, and then you get into a system which becomes confiscatory uh, and uh, everyone loses. And like Dengis Haoping said, uh, you know, it becomes what is called the iron ball syndrome where people, uh, you know, literally stop working. Um, and that, that was a problem that happened in communist countries before uh, they injected free market elements into it. So I think, uh, you know, I think as uh, people from batches across IIT, all of, most of us have become reasonably successful. I, I think we should make an endeavor uh, in certain areas uh, so that you could give back to society. I think our batch has done a good thing doing that. Um, and uh, we plan to continue doing that. We are planning to mentor these kids by having one-on-one -on -one sessions, but unfortunately COVID intervened with that. Um, but that is, um, uh, no, I, no, I love it. I love it. I love a whole lot of uh, aspects of what you have talked about. But let me ask you one question. The mattresses, they are there in your bedroom. Are they stuffed mm -hmm. with Hong Kong dollars or US dollars? <laughs> no, there's no money in any mattress. So, so uh, another you know, question is that what like, made you move? Uh, uh, Another question. No, no, the, the, see, the reason, see, I, and this is something in the other talk I said, I think it is important, uh, you know, um, uh, after I finished uh, MBA and joined Citibank, I moved uh, virtually with uh, no money. Uh, and I, I used to save probably 85, 90% of my take home pay at that stage. Uh, I barely used to spend money on anything. Um, and one of the things that happened in Citibank, which was good for me, um, uh, all the money, whatever little money I had, I used to buy one stock. 
And uh, I held that stock for 12 years, and eventually I made 1,500 times my invested money. And when that company went public, I think I was the eighth or ninth largest shareholder in that company, which uh, was a company <laughs> called iFlex. Uh, it was a company called iFlex, uh, which became the world's largest banking software company. So I think it is important, uh, you know, people realize that uh, uh, it is the early part of your life. Uh, you can take risks. Uh, you should take risks. Uh, you should invest your money well. Uh, you should start businesses if you feel you have the aptitude for it. Uh, because eventually, I think people who society gives a high quality education, who are in some ways gifted and privileged, I think the best thing they can do is to use their resources well so that uh, they generate wealth both for themselves and part of it goes back to society as well. No, fabulous. Uh, you see, you gave two, you know, options. One is from a private equity perspective, you're really buying undervalued companies and then kind of running them and generating value and selling them off. Second is, of course, you buy shares in them and they multiply, you know, whatever. And on that, I must tell you a story. When I first migrated to Australia in 1991, ZTV came out with an IPO in 1993. And at those days, you could still get stock, you know, and in the IPO. So I landed up with 1,000 shares, which I bought for 30 rupees a share. Then there was a, you know, stock split from 1 is to 10, so my 1,000 shares became 10,000 shares. And because I was living in Australia, I had forgotten all about it. In 1999, I suddenly realized that share Z had gone from 30 rupees to 1,600 rupees. And I had 10,000 of those shares. And I wanted to sell them, then I found that you had to get them DMAT. By the time sitting in Australia, I got the DMAT done and all that, the tech crash came. Hmm. So I was not experienced like you, you know, bankers, you know. But jokes apart, I love your story. You know, you had a couple of people from your batch like Raju, etc., you know, who's based in Toronto, and a couple of other people who have come and spoken at this forum. Now, one question to you is, why did you land up in Hong Kong? How did you oh, no, when I, uh, no, no, when I became co-head of Asia for Carlyle's mid-market business, uh, mm. that is when I moved to Hong Kong. Mm. And when I started my business, I just chose to continue living here rather than move to uh, so Singapore even, or and, anywhere and, else. Okay. And, and is still part of your business, uh, you know, to do with india like companies or is it... Uh, yeah, yeah I, 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 yeah, I still look, uh, majority of my workforce is out of India. I have a CFO who sits in Mauritius because... Uh, all the funds I had quartered out of Mauritius for various reasons. Um, uh, that's about it in uh, in a gist. Um, I just chose to live to Hong Kong so because uh, it's a place you, that's functional. You, and... you heard about the Pandora files recently? Yeah, yeah. You see, the Pandora <laughs> files, there are two things. One is, uh, see, I think one is what people have done illegally. And uh, there, there are a lot of people who have legally created these entities. No, no, I, I, I know. Uh, I know so I know. it depends. No, no, I, I'm fully across it because there have been quite a few cases where people have had, you know, investments in uh, shelf companies purely because of a number of valid reasons and they've been paying their dues or whatever is required kind of thing. But now coming back to, uh, uh, you know, the social aspect, is that typically a 1984 batch initiative? Or is it also your particular... Uh, see, uh, I, I think a batch has certainly taken that initiative on the scholarships. But uh, I have generally tried uh, in whatever boards I have sat uh, to try and make sure the companies end up doing something meaningfully. Um, you know, I have support... I currently sit on the boards uh, of uh, a company called Unite Fusion and uh, Visionary RCM, which is part of Coro Health. Uh, so we are supporting a trust called Nandavanam Trust, which uh, uh, works with, uh, you know, autistic, spastic children, etc. So suppose you're a daily wage earner and husband and wife work in a construction site in India and you have an autistic kid. Uh, what you generally do is uh, you just tie that kid to a table or chair or whatever it is, uh, have some food uh, down and then come back in the evening uh, and... Uh, uh, the child's future is pretty much doomed. So a lot of these kids, uh, we take them in the trust, uh, we give them therapy, we treat them, and try and make them self-sufficient. Uh, um, 
you know, someone who passed out in, I think, 81 batch, uh, uh, you know, again, he's done fabulous amount of work. I call Patu Keswani, uh, who started Lemon Tree. Yes. Uh, he, um, uh, for example, employs a lot of deaf and dumb people uh, in uh, uh his hotels and uh, it kind Lemon of helps tree. because yeah and uh, because uh, previously you know a lot of these people will struggle to find jobs because they don't have jobs they can't get married and uh, their life expectancy becomes very short uh, but Patu takes them trains them uh, employs them in the in his restaurants and housekeeping etc uh, and uh, g- uh, gives them a future so uh, so in Nandanam Trust, we've done both, uh, you know, the work of planting trees plus uh, working with disadvantaged children. When I was on the board of Scient, uh, you know, we used to support two initiatives. We used to support, um, um, uh, you know, eye care for, for poor people, you know, because cataracts, etc. Uh, the surgery itself is very cheap, but a lot of people in rural areas especially go blind. So through the LV Prasad Trust, we used to support that. Plus, one of the major reasons why girls drop out of schools uh, in most parts of India is the lack of access uh, to bathrooms. Uh, you know, most of these schools don't have separate uh, decent bathrooms for girl child. So uh, around the Telangana, Hyderabad area and Andhra area, uh, in a lot of government schools, etc., we sp- spent a lot of time uh, making these bathrooms, etc., and enhancing uh, female enrollment. So I, I think it becomes uh, incumbent on uh, people like us uh, in whatever way we can. I, I don't think we can uh, uh, kind of dictate what other people can do. So each one to his own conscience. So but let to me kind of just respond one way of letting you know that Patu will be coming on GCC sessions. Okay. I will not disclose when, but I can confirm that he will be coming. Yeah, Patu is outstanding. I have gotten to know him pretty well. I speak to him reasonably often. And, very good. Uh, Excellent. Know, he, he's really good. So now another question that I have is that post uh, China and the current Hong Kong situation, you are still living in Hong Kong? You prefer to live in Hong Kong? Yeah, see, look, I have no quarrel with the Chinese government. No, no, I not, don't think the Chinese terms of government. In condition, how no, is it? No, 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 it is nothing. I, I like the enormity. It's a place that is extraordinarily well run. Uh, you know, I have not used a mask uh, when I'm in the open uh, for maybe the last 15, 16 months. Uh, I don't think it's a luxury you can have anywhere else in the world. Uh, of course, when I go into a mall or something like that, uh, I wear a mask. Uh, Hong Kong has had literally no cases uh, for several months, um, and uh, it's an extremely well-run place. It's an expensive place to live because rents are very high, uh, but it's a, f- a place that is functional. It works, um, and um, I-, I think longer term, uh, you know, uh, this is the place where, where we may end up uh, settling down. Fabulous. In fact, in 2019, in the good old days before the pandemic, when I used to travel all over the world, I I have traveled to Hong Kong three times, you know, when I was speaking at different conferences. And in fact, I was quite surprised because I used to find it uh, very green, which was, you know, very, very surprising to me, considering that it's such a uh, congested island kind of a thing, but some great stuff happening over there. No, no, Hong Kong, actually, the place I live is uh, literally a stone throw away from the heart of Hong Kong, that is from the Bank of China building, it's literally a stone throw away. Um, and there are several trails and parks uh, uh, that I go to literally every day. You know, there's a Bowen Trail on the side of a mountain. There is the Hong Kong Botanical and Zoological Park. There's the Hong Kong Park. So there are several things. So the advantage that Hong Kong has is it's gone very vertical. And I think that is the mistake some of our cities like Bombay, Chennai, etc., have done. Uh, we should have created the infrastructure where instead of like two FSI or one FSI, which is in the uh, island city, you give 10, 15, 20 FSI, but preserve op- uh, green open spaces. Uh, you know, Bombay doesn't have any green open space worth the name. The only thing which is there is the Borivili National Park, uh, which over the years has had tremendous uh, 
uh, encroachments, the RA green, there's the resell controversy. So I don't think we have preserved uh, our green uh, areas as well as we should do, uh, primarily because of a lack of planning. I was speaking, in fact, to one of the guys from my batch who's a professor uh, in IIT Bombay, and the way we've designed our drains, the way you know we've designed uh, our bridges, our traffic systems, etc., is unfortunate. It, it, uh, we could have done a much better job. Fabulous. So two questions now, last two questions. One is that you've also been featured a number of times in business world, and you've been called the rainmaker in private equity. So tell us more what exactly have you been doing getting deals? No, see, the, the clear thing is uh, you should have some idea of what happens, what doesn't happen. And, um, you know, investing like life itself is uh, governed by the laws of economics. Uh, uh, you know, so if um, uh, in India, Hong Kong or Singapore or even Australia, you look out uh, and uh, they see a construction site on a hot day or a cold day, uh, you see a guy do hard physical labor, um, and that is work probably none of us can do. And the poor guy gets uh, far less money than any of us make uh, uh, are able to do. Um, and investing is like that. There are certain businesses uh, that will have high multiples, uh, whether it is uh, multiples of earnings or multiples of revenues, uh, because those businesses people think have some kind of fran uh, franchise value, some kind of defensive barriers. Uh, great growth prospects, uh, high return on equity and capital employed, etc. Uh, so they do well, and uh, that is the story of life, uh, you know. Uh, so, so last question: What value proposition would you like to see from GCC and IITDA? I, I personally think uh, you know uh, Almanai should network uh, better uh, because, uh, in many ways. Uh, uh, the modern world, uh, you know, uh, you never know who can help whom, uh, when. Uh, so networking uh, would help a lot, uh, whether it is IIT alumni in uh, uh, Australia or whether it is the alumni in the U.S. or the alumni who stayed back in India. Uh, I, I think uh, we should network much more. Uh, maybe we should have our own version of LinkedIn. Um, and uh, we should try to help uh, one another whenever we can, uh, you know, because it's always a win-win kind of thing. And together we should try to make a difference, uh, especially in our country, uh, to people who are less fortunate than us, uh, who, if they had uh, uh, greater opportunities, uh, could probably have done as well as us, if not better, because... Uh, uh, I think we were fortunate to be born at the right place, uh, go, go to the right schools, uh, be aware of the right opportunities. And I'm sure there were a lot of kids our age, if they had the same opportunity, who would have done as well, if not better. And so we got to make sure that uh, uh, each of us in our own way contribute something back to society. Thank you very much, Shankar. A pleasure meeting you and hosting you today. And we'll have a follow-up call Take, you get you more involved into the platform that we are building and it was really lovely please give a big round of applause to Shankar thank you and with that we come to the end of GCC episode 13 as usual we will have GCC episode 14 next Saturday at 6 30 p.m. Indian Standard Time and all I will tell you at this stage is that we will have a session presentation by whom? By the Singapore co-leader Priya Dashi about his plans for Singapore. But I will not reveal who the other speakers are going to be. It's a bit of a surprise. Take care. Have a lovely morning, evening, afternoon, evening or night. Enjoy your morning tea, afternoon, lassi, evening, wine. Pradeep, one sec, just before you wrap up, I had to ask this question to Shankar. We yeah. recognize his voice as a jammer. Was he a jammer at uh, I, Rendezvous? Uh, I have taken part in jam competition. Ah, uh, there you are. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I remember you and uh, Andre Purushottam ganging away, and that's what I was trying to confirm. 
Thanks, Pradeep. I, so I, 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 but I have not done much, your but voice, I have taken part. Your yeah. face, Narayanan. We need to see your yeah. picture from the from the campus. <laughs> oh sure. Great work, okay. man. You've done a okay, great thanks. work across the world. Okay, great. Thanks. So, so thank you very much, everyone. Take Pradeep, care. Pradeep, question you. for you. Yeah. Pradeep, question for you. Yeah. Vijay yeah. here from Toronto. Uh, so did Shankar rag you in Aravalli? Shankar no, rag? I am not. No, no, Shankar I am is... not in. Uh, no, I am junior, yeah. Uh, he is junior to me, yeah. I, oh, I finished. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, okay, okay. I confused with the mixed with the other person who was from. No, what you, 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 I think your question Sankar. was what to Sanjay said. I, I, I rag yeah. Shankar in Nilgiri. <laughs> 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 uh, 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 hey, hey, Shankar, how are you? Hi, hey, good, good. good. Out of campus, by good, the time Sunil, we were good, in campus. Good. Uh, I, I think Sunil, you should get your good friend Thousand, man. <laughs> <laughs> Sunil, Sunil is getting Sunil is getting quite a few good friends, but we shall keep that as a secret for the time being. So more about it next time. Take care. Bye from Sydney.